Good afternoon, uh, Brother Darren, Darren Sylvester, distinguished uh, barrister in uh, London, uh, certainly United Kingdom of Dominican heritage. Uh, and so today's date, December 2nd, 2023, I thought it uh, fitting and proper a thing to do to ask him to share uh, some of his life with us. Uh, I've known Darren now for more than a decade or so, and he has distinguished himself in our relationship with someone who is, is, is open, dynamic, visionary, uh, kind, and also civic-minded. And I, 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 uh, I'm not sure whether I met him here in Washington area or in London at the House of Lords first. I'm not sure which came first. I think the House of Lords was in 2017, Darren? Yes, the House of Lords came first, that's right. Yes. So had you, okay, so that came first, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. So Darren, as I said earlier, um, you know, uh, I'm gonna ask you a little bit of your life and your education, your family and all that, and growing up in the UK as someone of Dominican heritage and what that means for us. And towards the end, I will ask you about, uh, you know, after having that retrospective, talking about what you see, you'd like to see in the future and those uh, value uh, systems and that value engineering, which you made for your success, and how that can be applied to a greater community to allow for its success. Mm -hmm. Is that okay with you? That's more than fine, Robert Gage. All right. Uh, Darren, um, when were you born and where were you born? So I was born in uh, in August 1981, uh, and I was born in London in a hospital called Whips Cross Hospital, which is in East London. Um, okay. And then uh, I grew up in an area called Forest Gate, which is not too far from that hospital, about maybe 20 minutes by car. Um, and uh, was ingrained in um, very much part of the community in Forest Gate. There's a church in Forest Gate called St. Anthony of Padua Catholic Church, which uh, actually has a lot of Dominicans attending. Uh, you, you may know in the UK there's a hotspot for Dominicans. Bradford is one of them, which is further north in the UK. Uh, Liverpool has some, Preston has some, but East London has a lot. And this area of East London, Forest Gate, has a large concentration of Dominicans. And whenever there's a Dominican mass, like La Salette mass or uh, Fetzer, the pair, there's a huge Dominican contingent. So I grew up around Dominicans from a very young age in, in Forest Gate. You know, Dad, that's interesting because I just spoke to uh, uh, Pamela Clark, who uh, went to the UK. She was born in Dominica in 58 and went to the UK in November 66. And mm -hmm. she mentions Forest Gate. And, oh, uh, she made, there you go. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. She said to me that uh, she said in an interview, which is on YouTube, that Forest Gate is has a high concentration of Dominicans. It does, yes, yeah, it does. yes, indeed. What other ethnic groups uh, can be found in Forest Gate? Well, it's always been a diverse area or borough. So you have Muslims, you have Hindus, you now have a lot of uh, Eastern Europeans, uh, Polish, Polish people. So it's a, it's a real mixed bag, which is good, um, yeah. and it's always been that way. But since maybe in the last twenty years. We've had more Eastern Europeans come in than there was before. So it used to be just the West Indians, the Asians, um, uh, and, uh, you know, how can we put it? People people from the old Commonwealth. Yeah, that's right, the, the old, old Commonwealth. Empire. So, yeah, that's right. That's how I was going to say. Yeah. But, but now it's a real, if you go to St. Anthony's Church now, you will find probably over 50 or 60 different uh, nationalities. And uh, they do every year. I, I'm not a parishioner there anymore, but I go occasionally. They do every year. Uh, a, a, a time when every nationality brings a dish so all cultures can sample each other's culture's dish which I think is really really wonderful you know? and is St. Anthony's your uh, home church yes I was baptized uh, well no, I was baptized in um, a church in Stratford which is not too far from Forest Gate but then I made my holy communion and confirmation in, in St. Anthony's in Forest Gate so. outstanding were you an acolyte there uh, Darren that's right. Yes, 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 yes. And I think you are uh, a late. Uh, I don't know. I, I I've seen you in 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 uh, let's say clerical garb, so to speak. So are you are you a deputy priest or, or what? No, no, no. I just stick to. I just stuck to altar serving. Uh, 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 you know. That's, so you're altar server. Yeah, or acolyte as I think Dominique could call them acolyte in Dominique. Okay. So, okay. Yes, so. indeed. So who are your parents, uh, Darren? So my father, Shan Sylvester, born in Marigot. Um, the first of uh, the family of Edney Sylvester and Muriel Sylvester, uh, again from Marigot. Uh, my mother's Doreen. Um, uh, how can I put it? So they met, I believe, in around the 70s time. So I was born 81. Yeah, probably about 74, 75, I believe they met. I'm not sure how they met. Um, Doreen is also from Dominica? No, no, no. Doreen is not from Dominica. Doreen is uh, British. British. Okay. Uh, British. Um, uh, so they met, and then, um, yeah, I, I, I'd say I was born in 1881, and 
you know, I had a good life, a school, schooling, good parents. What did your father do? So he was an engineer, motor mechanic. Um, okay. That was his trade. Uh, he was, when he came to this country, he did national service um, in the in the 50s. He did national service uh, for two years. And I think that's and what When you say national service, you're talking about the military. That's right. Yeah. So he was schooled in Dominica, um, probably to junior school level, and came here at 19 and a half. And uh, he went more or less straight into the army, as I understand it. I've got his army records and I've got his ship records mm -hmm. and did two to two and a half years in the army. And I think it's in the army where he learned the engineering and motor mechanics. And that was his trade until uh, until well, he passed. He passed away in 1996. So he was still. Oh, doing my that. condolences. I didn't know. Yes. Yes. He passed away in 1996. How old was he? He was 60 in 1996. Yeah, yeah so that's pretty young. Yeah. Not quite near retirement, but um, edging to retirement. And it was yes. uh, prostate cancer that took him took him out. Yes, uh, yes, yes. We the, all have to do that PSA test. That's right. we get. Once you're north of 50, I think it's highly recommended. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Did um, he, do you have any pictures of him in uniform? Uh, I'm not, yes, I think one I have in uniform. One I have in uniform, black and white picture in uniform. Yeah. Do you know what unit he served in? Yes, I do. I've got the file there. I can uh, email you the details. I've got his, his army records, which I requested. Um, Outstanding. 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 Did, you, did you serve overseas? I don't believe so. It's not shown in the records that he did. Yeah, it's not shown in the records. Yeah. I just interviewed the uh, Jamaican-born nurse who met uh, Michael Douglas, the father of uh, uh, MP for Portsmouth, Ian Douglas, and the mm -hmm. brother, the older brother of Rusey Douglas, the famous Rusey Douglas. Mm -hmm. And he'd served in the Royal Air Force in the 50s as well, in Cyprus and Aden. Right. And it's actually done, uh, I think his wife said, he served as a county councillor at the in the in the town outside his Air Force base. Mm -hmm. And that's where he first started in politics. But he returned to Dominica in 69 and became a very outstanding politician and Minister of Finance and Minister of Communication Works. Sure. So there's a long history of Dominican serving. Mm -hmm. uh, include my father. My father didn't serve in England. We served in the war so did, yes. in the Caribbean. Yes. And then, of course, your your uh, wife's, I think, um, father, uh, father-in-law, a stepfather's father was a Bryant. Yes. A Harold yes. Sherbert Bryant, DFC, the Distinguished Flying Cross. I think yes. you were yes. so kind as to uh, share some documents with me. Yes. I'm uh, pleased to advise you that those documents are now on the website uh, www.caribbeanaircrewworldwar2.com. And I have seen them. them back. You've right. seen them, okay, good. Yes. So that way, you know, the, the world can benefit from that history of, yes. of Dominicans who served. So your father was a mechanical engineer or auto mechanic uh, engineer, yes. and your mom, Doreen? So she was like a civil servant. She's retired, she's a civil servant. She worked uh, what we call um, Inland Revenue. Uh, it's now called okay. His Majesty's Revenue and Customs, as it would be called now. So yes. she did uh, work for the Inland Revenue. And then in latter, the latter part before her retirement, she was in local government uh, dealing with uh, pensions and things like that. So yeah. um, that, that's, that's, she was just uh, anything from an administrator to a, um, a civil servant is just what it's called, really. So, um, Outstanding. Outstanding. Standard, and do you, standard, standard and do you have any siblings? No, I'm the only child. I'm the only child. Yes, indeed. And um, you grew up in uh, East London or West London? East. East. First case is East London. East London, yeah. And where did you attend school? So I attended school in uh, Essex, which is a uh, distance from uh, East London, but I took a, took a train, um, which is about 20 minutes, uh, quite a quick train. Um, both junior junior school up to 11, and uh, from 11 to 16 was a secondary school, again, all in, all in Essex, so, um, which was good. Made, Why would made... your parents send you 20 minutes away by train from the neighborhood? That's the type of people that they, they, they were. They like give you independence. Um, don't don't take things for granted. They were that, 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 that way inclined. So the schools in the area were very good. Um, but I think it's just, as I say, growing a sense of independence and you know, eleven years old having to to uh, get on the train early mornings. So yeah, to start out earlier than so, most. So early would you have to start? So school school started from memory at about uh, ten ten minutes to nine. So I would be I would be certainly by ten to eight. I'd give myself an hour uh, just to allow anything. So you know, but but uh, whereas other school kids would only have to walk five or ten minutes or ride a bike for five or ten minutes, I used yeah. to give myself an hour an hour's journey because I also had to get a bus 
once I got off the train, I had to get a bus to, to as well. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you know, our common, uh, uh, let's say, the commonality we share is that both of, both of us were born uh, when uh, our sovereign was Queen Elizabeth. I, I remember on our yes. exercise books, uh, there was a picture of the King of Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh mm -hmm. in royal regalia. And yes. I remember her visit in 66, but everybody was very disappointed, including Pamela, who said the same thing. And in my, one of my books, which you should have a copy of, Rain on a Teen, on a teen Roof, oh, yes, people we have were waiting for the queen to be with the crown and the scepter and all mm -hmm. the you know uh, ermine cloak but she was just in a plain jane pink dress mm -hmm. did you have those pictures on your exercise books in england Paul? not 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 when i was at school i mean obviously we were aware that the queen was the head of state um and uh but we didn't have pictures of the queen or the monarch on our exercise books um yeah and did you have pictures of the king or uh, i mean the queen and the duke of edinburgh on the school wall uh, there were portraits in the assembly hall. I seem to recall portraits in the assembly hall. Yeah. In those days, we had to sing. We had more than assembly, um, and before any classes began. And I used to be one of the people that operated what was called then the overhead projector that used to have the the hymns, uh, you know, on on some translucent paper. Yes, and I used to be the one. Well, sometimes sharing it with another person, and it used to project on a screen. And like what? when we were saying all the things bright and beautiful, it had, I don't know, six or seven verses and you had to move move the sheet so it could, you could see the verses. <laughs> Interesting. So so what about Britannia? Did you all sing that, the national anthem? Uh, not at school. In the Scouts, we did that. I was also a Boy Scout. Yeah. Yes, and we yes. did more of that in the Scouts. And uh, uh, we had to pledge allegiance to the Queen when I was in the Scouts as well. And that was also yeah. the time I was at, uh, in my school days, I was a Boy Scout in the evenings as well. I know we're going to talk about value engineering later on, but since you brought it up, it might as well be the case we start now. Mm. Would you say that your role in the Boy Scouts had a lot to do with your later success in life? I think so, because again, it goes back to kind of discipline and, um, you know, how you structure your day, how you structure time, what you learn, who you meet. And I think it did. It's, it's a good grounding. It's a good foundation uh, for, for, future, for the future. And it certainly it didn't do me any harm. Um, it was a good outlet from school. I enjoyed school, but it was a good outlet to meet new people because the people in the Scouts were not also people that went, I went to school with. They went to different schools. So you're meeting new people. You're expanding your friendship base. We used to go camping. We used to do orienteering. Um, things which, obviously, this is all before social media and, and things like that. So it was a way to really enjoy youth. And we did enjoy yes. youth. You know. So, so were you a Cub Scout and then a Boy Scout? No, I was never a Cub Scout. I just went straight into the Boy Scouts. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I ended up as a patrol leader and a senior patrol leader, got some badges, which I think not too many, about six or seven, which was like camp cook and orienteering and cycling and things like that. So I enjoyed, I, enjoyed, I really enjoyed it. And then I, I sort of did about five years and thought that was enough for me, I think. <laughs> okay. So, so how old were you when you joined the Scouts? Uh, I think I was 11 or 12. And uh, I came out about yeah, 15 or 16 when, when, I, when I left school and then went on to college. Uh, that's why I think I dropped out and went on to college. Uh, which... So your scout troop, was that part of the St. Anthony's Church or was that part of your school? No, it wasn't part of the church or the school. It was um, <clears throat> a, a friend of mine was in the scouts and he got me in it. So it was called Second Collier Row. Collier Row is in Essex, very, very near where I went to school. So it was Second Collier Row Scout Group. We used to meet on a Wednesday evening at around 7 or 7.30 to around 9 or 9.30. Um, and I say we'd go away for camping trips and expeditions and uh, do map reading, orienteering and weather. We learned uh, the weather, the, all the clouds, uh, Cumulonimbus and Sirius and all these things we learned, um, which we wasn't learning in school, actually. And I did geography and we didn't cover the weather in geography. So yes, it was really yeah, good. Sirius and Cumulonimbus and all that stuff. Yes, yeah, so all that stuff. That's right. That's right. Um, so yeah, so let me ask you. A friend got me in it and that's how I joined Second Career Rose Scout Group. Okay. So in, in high school, did you have a cadet corps? No, no, we didn't. My school didn't, no, no. I was told that in England, there's three kinds of schools. There's a grammar school, which mm -hmm. is one kind of school, then there's a public school, and mm -hmm. is there a third? So you've got the state comprehensive is one, as you say, the grammar is another, and then the private, or some people call it private because you pay privately. Some people call it public because um, some of them are just known as public schools. But Do you I, have to pay for those? Uh, the public schools and some grammar schools you pay for. The state comprehensives are free. Um, I went to the state comprehensive, but I must say I had some very, very good teachers. So 
uh, I don't know if I was fortunate or blessed or lucky that the teaching I got was probably of the standard that of the grammar school or a fee paying school, even though it was a state comprehensive. I think I was just very lucky um, to have very good teachers. So um, let, who, let me ask you this question. Uh, are the cadet programs more or less in the grammar schools or the private schools? Yeah, the private schools uh, and the grammar schools would probably have the cadet programs because they have people are paying. So they'll put on more resources and uh, things like that. The state system when I was at school was pretty bog standard unless you had an interest to develop yourself. So not everyone in my year or my class would join the Scouts. It was something that I chose to do. Um, yeah. um, so it really is really that discipline within yourself or your self-will that puts yeah. you forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Darren, let me ask you, when was your first um, sort of, uh, when did you have your a, a, a first understanding or consciousness rather of Dominica and of your Dominican heritage? Oh, from a very young age, as I say, growing up in Forest Gate, I was always around Dominicans. And dad was a member of the Dominic Overseas Nationals Association, which is DONA. He, was a, he wasn't a founding member, but he was the first tranche of the members in 1978. Uh, Alfonso Charles was the founder, um, and that was in June 78. And dad joined in December 78. So I say he was in the first tranche of, of members of the Dominic Overseas National Association. And... Um, so I'd say from around the five, six, seven, I was exposed to Dominica and Dominicans. And I was taken to the meetings, uh, general meetings from around the age eight, nine or 10 as a youth youth member. Um, they used to have Christmas parties uh, where the young people would all gather together and different social events. So I was exposed to it at a very, very young age. Um, and I think that's why, that's why uh, my passion has grown for Dominica. Mm -hmm. So when you would start first first time having a sense of consciousness of being of Dominican heritage, mm. how did they how did Dominican Dominicans uh, appear to you? What did you think about the culture, the way they spoke, the way they carried themselves? What what sort of what you know um, ideas formed in your mind of, of, of that heritage? Well, it was um, <clears throat> I read the 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 first book the. Um, one by Hansip. I don't know if you have it in America. Um, yes, Nathan, I've seen you know, it. The Caribbean. So we have that on our bookshelves. And I was always dipping into reading about Dominica and seeing the, the pictures and, and reading about it. But to answer your question, you know, Dominic, I found them fine. Um, I found them fine as a young child. And uh, I just found it all, how can I put it, mesmerizing, I suppose is the right word. You know, this beautiful country. Why would people leave and come to cold England? And yes, have, yes. Have, uh, so that was a sort of, uh, juxtaposition um, because this island is so beautiful but then yeah. you start speaking to people and you found out when my dad left in the 50s the opportunities weren't there then as you know it wasn't a really developed country then uh, England was much more even though England had the after effects of the war second world war there was still chance for jobs and work and and as you know probably everyone in the Windrush generation said they would only be in England for five years they would make their money and come back and then 60 years later they're still here yeah um, you know, so you know the story. But no, I, 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 I've, I found them, by and large, a diligent people, industrious people, um, very enterprising and very um, engaging, um, passionate um, people in the, the UK Dominican community. I know are, are that way inclined, civic minded, as you would say. Um, certainly when we had recently the Hurricane Maria and Tropical Storm Erica, the amount of help that the UK community gave was phenomenal. Um, oh, indeed. And I just want to, as one diaspora, Dominican, I want to just salute our brothers and sisters in the UK because you've always been exemplary in organization. And so in that regard, I'm going to ask you about a few things. Um, how would Dominicans, uh, over the years, uh, you've been able to observe the Dominican community, in particular those who were born in Dominica and later came to the UK, how did they present in way of a passion for education? Yeah, so um, some really took to it because uh, it was free up until I think 2000 or 2001, tertiary education was free. So the state paid if you wanted to do your bachelor's or master's or PhD, it was totally free. And that changed in around 2000, 2001. So people like the Vincent Johns of this world, they have four or five degrees, which is great. Um, but they, 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 they was the government paid for them. Where and when you say Vincent John, that's a Dominican diaspora leader in UK. Yes, he's a, he, he's a UK um, Dominican diaspora leader. So he's very well educated, um, MBA and, uh, and, and law, law degrees and so on. 
so he really excelled. Other people have David Michael, the, uh, the detect, former detective chief inspector. Um, I think you're he, talking about the Scotland Yard. That's David right, Chief Inspector. Yeah, Scott, David, right. David Michael. David Michael. Um, and there are others. I just pulled these two out because I know them fairly well. They, these two have really done well ac academically. Um, some chose to just focus on work and raising families and buying houses, which is fine. Um, but England did have the opportunity for those who wanted to, to study academically. And as I said, at those times, up until 2000, it was free. So, so would you say that the average Dominican you met was relatively well educated and well spoken? Yes, yes. I mean, the, the standard of education in Dominica was always high. So that you didn't have to you don't have to go to university to be, you know, well educated. The standard in Dominica, I understand, was always very high. The the teachers would teach varied um, subjects: geography, history, maths, English, science, French, German, whatever. Um, yes. They were very versatile, both at the uh, Dominica Grammar School and the SMA. So I've never met really uh, uh, an illiterate or. or I mean, an intelligent, should we say, Dominican. Yeah. Um, I'm sure they exist, but I just haven't really come across them in my general sphere because they, they tend to be well, well, uh, well educated. For those who will hear this and, and may not know Dominican's history, the Dominican Grammar School was started as a school for the planters and commercial elite, administrative elite, in 1893 on Dominica, mm -hmm. and the St. Mary's Academy somewhere in 1933 by the Catholic Church. And those two schools are what uh, you would say would be equivalent to, uh, in England, Eton or Harrow. And the uh, graduates of those schools uh, in both worlds were one and two for the grammar school, World War II for the SMA, uh, served in the Royal Air Force and British Army, and, and later on in corporate life in UK and uh, United States, Canada, and rose to high office. I mean, I have had occasion to interview Brigadier General Eddie Charles, who was a cadet at the SMA and Grammar School, uh, uh, cadet with my brother, and of course, the, the, the Schillingfords and Dr. Sherman Severin, who was a member of the team that developed the Intel chief PhD in physics. So these schools uh, were uh, world class, mm -hmm. and as uh, Darren Whiteley said, produced uh, graduates who uh, have excelled across the globe. So, uh, Darren, what about their um, social skills? Do you, did you find Dominicans be, in England to be friendly, kind? I I mean, I've had my differences with a few, a uh, few of them over the years, but that's nothing. Um, those those differences were settled quite quite um, quickly. Um, but by and large, yes, I found them to be warm, friendly, um, accommodating, helpful, um, giving. Um, for example, in Dono, we used to have a stall at the Notting Hill Carnival, and the amount of work people were doing in terms of cooking, help set up, help pack down, help tidy up. It was just again phenomenal. People would give their time, their money, their resources all for the betterment of Dominica, because the money's raised would be... So you're saying that Donna, just so for those who understand, Donna, the Dominica Overseas National Association in the United Kingdom, That's correct. during the famous Notting Hill Carnival, would have a store selling food. For 18 years, we they had a... No, I wasn't in it for the whole 18 years, but the, the ones... the I did it for about, I don't know, five years, maybe a bit more. But people like the Alfonso Charles, the Athelka Brands, the Amos Charles, the... Vincey Waldrons, the Eleanor, Roy Desbonds, these people were the, the older people and they were, they were doing that for 18 years. Um, and what would they sell out of that stall? Well, you know, you'd have curry, goat and rice, you'd have fish, you'd have uh, bakes, you'd have, uh, you know, drinks, you'd have carrot cake, you'd have rum punch, you'd have anything that, you know, a whole array of, and that's what I say, it wasn't just one person doing that. We'd have to, in those days, the carnival didn't stop till gone midnight. And when you were there yeah. on the Sunday and the bank holiday Monday, you couldn't pack down on the Sunday until the last float had gone. And you have yes. to be back there at seven o'clock on the Monday morning to reset up again. And so it was hard, hard work, 18 hour, 19 yeah. hour days, and you need all hands on deck. And that's why I say I've found Dominicans to be really giving of their time, their money, their resources, and their efforts. Uh, because it and all of that money was to be plowed back into the organization to help the community and Dominica when in need. Exactly, exactly. So, um, this is where I can only speak for Dona, but I know Do if you speak to anyone of like Mrs. Brand's tenure, she will tell you straight the money Dona raised was by and large from the Notting Hill Carnival because over those two days, I don't know what they'd make, but they'd make a, a, a good sum selling food, selling drinks, selling t shirts, or with Dona's logo branding on, whatever. That was yes. that. They do other fundraising events throughout the year, but that was the main, that's where you make the money, you know, at the carnival. I want to tell you, uh, you know, uh, Darren, to my uh, great, uh, you know, joy, I've had occasion to see uh, on YouTube um, videos of the carnival, and I, I've seen quite a few Dominican flags. Mm. And on one occasion, 
Guess who I saw in the band? No less a person than the detective chief inspector himself, oh, yeah, David he, Michael. He, he's a reveler. He's a reveler. He likes carnival. Yeah, <laughs> he's a reveler. <laughs> yes, indeed. He was. He was not in his police uniform. I can. I can assure you. <laughs> uh, what about organization? Did you find among Dominicans a degree of dedication to organized effort? Again, there's room for improvement, but by and large, to set up a registered charity when they did in the 70s was quite difficult. There probably was a resistance for black charities to exist, given the racism and racist undertones that existed in, in London. But they persevered and they did. Uh, there was JUCA, Dominica UK Association, was registered in 1978. Dona, Dominica Overseas National Association, was registered in 1978. So everything ties up with Dominica's independence, also 1978. So just like Dominica celebrated 45 years of independence in November, I think Duca was September of 78 and Dona was June of 78. So there's a few months difference between the two, but it was very hard to do. They did it. They're still going. Dona's still going. Duca's still going. A few others have fallen by the wayside, but that's the natural way of life. Um, uh, but we hope to get to 50 in five years' time and have a big celebration either together or independently. But uh, uh yeah, I, 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 as I said, there's room for improvement, things that could have been done different, things that slightly late in filing accounts and all those type of things. But maybe I'm being a bit too pedantic. But um, by and large, they've done very well to raise the monies that they've raised. And as I say, when Erica came and Maria came, both the DNDF, Dona and Juca were able to write checks within days of that disaster, which very few yeah. associations could do. Because they didn't have the resources to do so. And there are other Dominican associations in other parts of the UK. Yeah, there are. There are. There's. I think there's one in Bradford. There is, uh, as I mentioned, Bradford earlier. There's one in Bradford. There's one in um, Preston in Lancashire. Um, there's more in London. At one time, there was about twelve or thirteen Dominican associations just in London. Amazing, so had, twelve or thirteen. Yeah. So you had like the Indigenous Carib Organization. You had the La Salette Committee. You had Dominican Development Association. You had uh, and a few more that I know, but they all were like just, when I say smaller, they were probably had about eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 people, whereas Dona, one time Dona on its books had like 400 people, you know, when it yes. height. And of course, probably. coming from a very small island of about 75, yeah. 80,000 people, that's quite a lot, isn't it? That's quite a lot. And don't forget, everyone was younger then, people, you know, everyone was was um, more more committed um, we didn't have to say this social media, so people just generally work, raise their families, and that was their outlet, dinner and dances. And social. Let me hear about, thank you, let me hear about uh, your impression or your opinion of Dominicans in way of being law-abiding in the United Kingdom. Yeah, again, I mean, uh, I don't know of anyone that's been sort of arrested or or, or, or criminally charged or anything. They, they are, they're law-abiding. Um yeah, in the years I've been dealing with Dominic, I've not come across. We've had different events, dinner and dances, carnivals. I've never really seen a Dominic can get in trouble in any way. So I say there's that's again civic mindedness, respect for law, respect for rule of law, respect for order. Um, but again, I'm sure there are Dominicans that don't have that mindset. But in in the UK, at least. But but uh, by and large. Yeah, by and large, I think there's a, a, a respect, as I say, for rule of law and, and law and order and the police and authorities. Now, now that's coming, you know, what, you, what you're saying has been taken quite seriously because you are actually uh, an officer of the court. I, I take it from a good source that you are an attorney or a barrister at law. Mm -hmm. And you yep. attended law school where? Yeah, so uh, law school was what we call the Inzacult School of Law, which is part of City University. So it was a one year course at law school but before that we did our I did my LLB which I think is your Juris Doctor equivalent of uh, JD which was uh, three years of study uh, at the University of Essex. Yes. Um, yeah. Well the JD actually here is a postgraduate degree. Ah okay sorry yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. yes, yes. <laughs> LLB is a Bachelor of Laws but the JD you've got to you can only enter the JD program when you have a first degree. Right right okay. Yes, yes, okay. Yes. Um, and so, so you, so you graduated from Middle Temple, uh, Lincoln's Inn, Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn. Lincoln's Inn, but that's not named after Abraham Lincoln, is it? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
It's a very old, I, but not, not, not after him. It's, it, pre, it predates Abraham Lincoln. It's, uh, so yes, like, indeed. How, yes. How four, so. easy, I know. I mean, of course, Lincoln had, you know, uh, British antecedents himself, so that's where the word Lincoln comes from. And he was a lawyer himself, of course. But how easy was it, or how difficult was it to access Lincoln's in? Uh, it can be pretty difficult. But how I got in was, uh, when I say how, we used to go at, on the, in our final year of university, we used to go for student dinners. And that's how we used to meet people and uh, network. So that when, and I used to do that with all the inns, there's four. There's Lincoln's Inn, as you say, Middle Temple, Inner Temple, and Gray's Inn. They're the four inns of court in London. And as undergraduates, we used to get exposed to student dinners. So you meet students from other universities, all aiming to go to the bar, and we want to know which inn to join. So we'd experience all the dinners. And then uh, when I found that Lincoln's Inn had, I found more welcoming, uh, had more events, there was more opportunities for scholarships and things like that. I applied to Lincoln's Inn, quite a rigorous uh, assessment. Um, you had to get a lot of forms to fill in, references, um, and so on and so on. But anyhow, managed to get admitted. And then, uh, so I was admitted to Lincoln's Inn in January 2002 and was called to the bar July 2003. So, um, and I'm a life member of Lincoln's Inn. And so until I die, I'll be a member of Lincoln's Inn. Interesting. So there are four inns in London. It's Lincoln's Inn, Gray's Inn, Middle Temple, and Inner Temple. That's correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to understand this. So how old were you when you started at uh, Lincoln's Inn? Uh, so I would have been uh, 20, 2 zero, 20, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what did you do between age 15 and 20? Uh, so fi I finished school at 16. Mm -hmm. From 16 to 18, we did what we call A-levels, which is Stick college. A oh, okay, so uh, at 16, you got your O-levels. Uh, 16 was the equivalent of O-levels. We call them GCSEs, but O-levels is right there as well. Yeah. Back um, in my time, it was GC O-level with Cambridge. Right, that's right. We did Cambridge. the exam in May, and we got the results in uh, September. Yes, and they used to be marked in England, of course. That's right. Yeah. So 16 left school with, to use your word, the A level, O levels, then uh, two years for A level. So that takes me up to 18 at yeah. college. And from 18 to 21 was university doing the LLB. Okay. Yeah. So you do the LLB and then you get into the end. Yeah, you do the LLB, which is your bachelor's degree. You can go on and do master's and everything else. I chose not to do a master's. I wanted to get qualified and practice rather than have more academic uh, um, shall we say more academic uh, knowledge? So, so the the LLB the, uh, the LLB gives you the academic framework, and the in the the, the the one year the in is almost like practicum. That's right, vocational. We call it vocational, but practicum is right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you do drafting, advocacy, conferences, things like that. Whereas the LLB is like constitutional law, tort law, um, criminal law, uh, property law. So you do all the academic stuff in the LLB, and then the vocational stuff in the law school year. Okay. And when you got out in uh, 19, in 2002, did you work go work for yourself or you worked with uh, a firm? No, no, no. I only started working myself in uh, 2016. So between 2002 and, sorry, 2003 and 2016, I had a varied um, different roles. Some was in government, some was uh, in private practice uh, until I started up on my own in 2016. So I did some crime, I did some landlord and tenant, I did some civil. It's been a mixed bag, but good experience all the way through. And then it got to, Do you do any immigration? Uh, I have done, but it's not something that I, I put on my skill set, but I, I have done uh, two or three cases, uh, but fairly fairly easy cases, nothing nothing difficult. And, and you, you did a wonderful book on running a small law firm. That's right, uh, with a, um, another sole practitioner, Rachel, who uh, is in Yorkshire, so again, much more north than, than where I am now. Uh, we put our heads together and wrote this this book because we felt there was nothing out there to help new uh, law firm owners. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes when, I'm, when I started up, as I'm sure maybe you did, or, or uh, we all do, I think, if I'm right in saying that we all do. Well, I had the advantage of not starting up. I actually was a clerk at a uh, majority white law firm. Right. Got hired after law school, um, was working. The firm that I worked as a clerk from 88 to 91. I worked all through law school. And when I graduated, was kept as an associate. And in 92, the 21-person firm split. And I stayed with a senior partner because he was a paratrooper, captain in the 82nd Airborne. And so right. he had an interest in military history, which uh, somebody you know has a similar history as an old cadet. <laughs> and we, we hit it up and became friendly. So it was not simply law practice relationship, but a personal relationship. 
And so I stayed with him. And um, with the year later, he made me his partner in 93. And then in 96, we bought property. And 97, he died of a sudden massive heart attack. So it wasn't that uh, I had to step out of law school on my own. I was in a firm. That's right. And I've always been in a firm, you know. But I think what you did, and I had the high honor and privilege to be asked to make a comment. It was a very well done book because it is a, a primer on what the do's and don'ts should be, you know, of starting a law practice. So well, well done. I want to take a moment here, uh, Darren, to salute you. And I know there, well, there are a couple more books thank you for, from you. Thank you for reading it and for providing that wonderful testimonial that you did. So thank you as well. Oh, it was a high honor and privilege. And I really look forward to us doing more. But let me ask you this as a lawyer, in light of the uh, sanctions imposed on Dominica this July for the uh, issue of the citizen by, Citizenship by Investment Program, my questioning of you on the issue of Dominicans in the UK and their character was a lead up to that. Because typically, you know, uh, nation states uh, take a dim view of any community, especially if it is a migrant community or has migrant roots that misbehaves, quote unquote. Um, did any of that sanctioning of Dominica have to do with Dominicans in the United Kingdom themselves breaking laws? I don't have evidence to say yes or no, but I think generally it was to do with the way the CBI program is or has been managed. And yeah. I think tighter controls could could be um, put in place to manage that better. I think that's where it was coming from. The then Home Secretary was a lady called Suella Bravman, who has since been sacked. So she's not Home Secretary anymore. It's Lord Cameron, who was, of course, former Prime Minister. He's now, he's now, well, he's Foreign Secretary. It's um, it's a chap, a chap called Cleverly, who's now the so, so let me be a little more pointed, because you're very well educated in the way of Dominican heritage in the United Kingdom. And, of course, as a lawyer, you're very well up to date on the news. You've never heard of any Dominican in the United Kingdom being arrested for placing a bomb in a church or a school or any terrorist act, have you? I've not heard that. I've not heard that. And you've never heard of any arrest of any Dominican for being part of any extremist group that would be a threat to British national security, would you? Have you? I've not heard of British, no, 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 I've not heard. No, have you heard of Dominican communities in the United Kingdom being cesspools of drug dealing and gang banging and murders or anything like that? Have you? No, 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 no. And I try and keep up to date with the news, but uh, I've not indeed, heard. indeed, indeed, I'm reliably informed, as a matter of fact, that some of the people who have covered themselves in glory in the United Kingdom uh, from any community had Dominicans, like one uh, Baron Patricia Scotland of Ashton, who was of mm. Dominican birth, is that right? Well, she is of Dominican birth and she was the former Attorney General, but... Uh, oh, well, the Attorney General, does that have anything to do with law, Darren Sylvester? It does, yes. She was Attorney General in the Labour government. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. And is it true that she was the first black female cabinet member in British history? Am I mistaken? Uh, don't think she was the first black cabinet member. She was. She was never. No, female. 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 I think you could be right there. Yeah, because it was Botang was the first male. I think you could be right there. She was really? certainly the first Queen's Council uh, black female Queen's Council. Yeah. And Queen's Council does that have to do with somebody who's a chambermaid or is that someone who's a lawyer? That's a distinguished lawyer. That's been. I uh, see. Yeah. And and of course we've talked earlier about a certain gentleman by the name of David Michael. Yes. And he, he, he rose to quite a lofty perch in uh, at Scotland Yard, is that right? He I think he retired as a detective chief inspector, yeah. Yes, indeed. And the gentleman who we talked about earlier, who's related to you by marriage, Harold Sherbert Bryant, he served in an organization which is quite well respected in British history. It's Royal Air Force, is that right? Yes, he was in the Royal Air Force, that's right. Yeah. Okay, I'm sure you've heard of it. Yes. And you got the DFC, I think? That's right. It was uh, posthumously, the, the DFC, yeah. yeah. Distinguished Flying Cross. Yes, yes. I've got it medal. So, got it medal. Yes, yes. And, and of course, there's another uh, young lady by the name of Margaret Bosby, who's of Jamaican Dominican heritage as well, who's a distinguished author. I think she got an OBE recently. Right. Um, okay. yeah. So all of these people have Dominican antecedents or have something to do with Dominica. And mm -hmm. that has been the sort of color, contour, and character of their service. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you say, anyone from Patricia Scotland down, um, so she was uh, Attorney General. She's now the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat, um, very distinguished lady. Um, I think she's uh, related to the Christians in some way as well. Is that right? Andre. Ah, okay. Yeah, Busby, Busby's related to the Christian family. Right, yeah. right. 
Yeah, yeah. Busby is actually my second cousin. But oh. uh, and and Andre's uh, first or second cousin is is Baroness Scotland. Right. Uh, and and there's a fascinating story I must reveal. So when she became Attorney General, we just published the first book mm -hmm. uh, for King and Country: The Service and Sacrifice of the Dominican Soldier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I read it in the paper. So I said, you know, that's a great thing for someone, someone from Dominica could have become Attorney General of England, mm -hmm. uh, Northern Ireland and Wales, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. So I sent her a book, never expecting to wear anything. I mean, I figured, you know, someone in such a lofty position maybe mm -hmm. has two or three cordons of security and clerks that maybe would send me, if anything, some nondescript thank you note, all of three lines. Mm -hmm. So one day I came back to the office from court and I saw a brown envelope with the seal the royal seal on Her Majesty's service. Mm. And I opened it and it was a two page letter, two thirds written by type and the last third written in blue ink from mm. the Attorney General. Mm. And the reason was he had gotten the book and read the book and found her grandfather's name in the book. Okay. And mm -hmm. she said that she shared it with her cabinet colleagues. Right. That her father, her grandfather, had been in uh, Palestine with under General Allenby in the British West Indian Regiment. Mm -hmm. So she was fascinated because it was the first time she said she'd seen her grandfather's name in print in any way related to his military service in World War One. Right. And then she revealed that Irving, she said, very best regards to you and warmest regards to Irving, uh, her cousin. Right. And uh, that led to a uh, quickly, a uh, certain quick thinking attorney inviting, we're coming up with an idea of Caribbean glory and inviting her to Washington for the event, which is on YouTube yes. at the Andrews Air Force Base when we met for the first time. Fantastic. First and only time, frankly. And Fantastic. and uh, that then we took the second book out for King and Country, The Service and Sacrifice of the British West Indian Military, mm -hmm. which was to pay tribute to the veterans of World War One and Two from the British West Indies. And I share this with you uh, because I I, I, I uh, respect you very much because you represent that sort of trajectory, that sort of lineage of people from Dominica, small though, small though we may be as an island in way of number, uh, resource limited though we may be, uh, we don't have tons of gold and silver and oil, but we have somehow found a way to carve a very respectable place for our people sure. on the world stage. And I just wanted you to speak to that and what that makes you feel as a Dominican. What pride do you garner from that? Yeah, I th I, well, I think it's excellent because I see people like uh, just recently, Chris Etienne passed away, I think yesterday. She was the um, PAHO uh, and World, World Health Organization, very uh, held very high uh, positions in both of those. Just spoke to her cousin this morning about that. And uh, she was right here in this room where I'm interviewing with her husband and son when she yeah. got appointed. We, uh, you know, were honored to have her here mm -hmm. to salute her, her appointment. And I, I actually told him that there's a film. I went to her inauguration with a cameraman mm -hmm. and it was put up on YouTube. It got taken down because he used a copyrighted piece of music in it or something and they took it down. So I'm going to try to see if I can find the actual original mm -hmm. because she unfortunately died yesterday, December 1st yes. of, a, yeah. of, a, of a heart attack and we, we, we paid tribute to her. But the point you're making was... Well, and it goes on, Dame Eugenia Charles, Cardinal Felix. You know, they, we can go on for 10 minutes reading off names. You know, Eugenia Charles was a, a trailblazer. Um, Cardinal Felix, priest for 60-something years, made Cardinal maybe 10 years ago, virtually unheard of for a small island of Dominica. I think only two Cardinals, when he was appointed, came from the, the Caribbean region, and uh, mm -hmm. it was one of them, which was a great achievement. Um, you know, and there's a whole host of Dominicans that have, you know, made their mark in different spheres, science, um, law, uh, history, whatever. So for a small island, I think we punch well above our weight, which is good. You know? and, yeah. uh, How important do you think for small island states or any nation, for those who come from that nation or are linked to it by way of heritage like yourself, to um, exemplify the best characteristics of civic leadership and, 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 and beneficial social character? How important is that in the fate of a nation? Very, very important, very important. Um, the, the, I always say the skills and what you see growing up and what you do growing up, I think, last with you for your lifetime. So you you with your cadet corps, me with the Boy Scouts, the discipline and, and everything like that takes you through life. And you'll see from your generation of Dominicans, Irving Andre and, uh, you know, Sam, your brother, Christian, all of you have the same 
uh, in my view, the same discipline, the same the same respect for for democracy, rule of law. And I think that is uh, just the way you've been brought up, your experiences, your your family heritages, and things like that. So it's very important how we conduct ourselves when we come, like Dominicans came from Dominica to England, Canada, America. And I think that inbred and inbuilt um, sense of purpose and sense of wanting to achieve is very important. Darren, um, you know, you've, you've you worked in the legal system. You know how important it is to one success, to be able to stay out of trouble. What would your message be to be to young Dominicans in Dominica, young Dominican, or people of Dominican heritage in the United Kingdom and the wider Caribbean community? What would your, your message be to those young persons as they uh, step out, if they were so lucky as to listen to this tape? What would your message be to them in way of the success principles they should follow to, to make it uh, make, make a good life for it? Well, have faith, have hope, and never give up. I think it is pure and simple. Um, in Dominica, I think a lot now is is changed because in my father's time, he worked land. That's how he saved for his passage to, to England. His father didn't give him anything. His mother didn't give him anything. As I understand, he had a piece of land. He used to work that land and sell to, to save up for his passage. When you fast forward 60 odd years, it seems in Dominica now nearly everyone is looking for a handout. And, uh, you know, we've got to get that mentality away of this handout mentality. We have to work for ourselves or work in conjunction with other people and strive for because what any government did, whether it's a Skerritt government, a Grayville Christian government, a Darren Sylvester government, a government cannot do everything for everybody. Some people have to do things for themselves. And, Indeed. Uh, you know, we have to get back that mindset of discipline. And if it's working a piece of land or starting a business or being entrepreneurial or being enterprising, we, I think we have to, Dominicans have to go, young Dominicans have to go back to that rather than waiting for a, a handout because, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm all for helping people that are maybe disabled or can't work, then you can have a little support. But just yeah. to sit down in a rum shop all day and then want, want a handout, uh, I'm not of that school of thought at all. Indeed, indeed. And I was just reflecting, uh, Darren, um, so after, high, after sixth form, I taught for three years at my old grammar school First, agriculture science, and then English, English literature and geography. Mm -hmm. And I was remarking to my son and my daughter that every morning before I went to school, like it had been during the time I was at school, I had to get up at about six to go up to the stock farm and reduce and uh, feed the cattle. We had about six to eight heads of cattle, mm -hmm. and get the milk. I couldn't milk, but there, there was a milkery that the milkman would milk for us, and I'd bring the milk down in a bucket, mm -hmm. and then uh, I would. Illegally, uh, because my two older brothers uh, and then Dr. Sam had left, so I was the only boy at home, and I was only about fifteen. Mm. And I drive the car without a license to go to <laughs> drop the milk up in Roseau for four customers, yes. including the family of uh, a little minister of uh, uh, whatever he was, agriculture, Colin McIntyre. They would sell us eggs and we'd sell them milk. And the morning before I left for the United States at age twenty, I ran up. For the last time, I looked over the farm where the cattle were and, you know, and, and did my last chore and ran back, took a bath, headed to the airport, right? Mm. I only mention that to say that that kind of rigor, when I was confronted with poverty of means in Washington and the cold weather and no mother, no father, mm -hmm. certainly no prime minister to give me any handout. Yep. I had to work as a janitor. I worked yep. on Donald Trump's boat. I worked on the old presidential yard that Jack Kennedy used to be on. Mm -hmm. I had 80 boats in the Potomac River in minus 20 degree weather. Sometimes mm -hmm. the river froze over mm -hmm. and sometimes near 100 degree in the summer weather. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, people would say, you know, uh, <laughs> you're from Dominica. Why, why are you in this weather? You know, just like <laughs> your father yep. said, you know, you, you're there in search of opportunity. Yes. And I would be taking out trash in a big trash cart, you know, and, and in, the, in, the, in the springtime when all nice, Nicely dressed ladies and men and ladies and you know uh, gentlemen would be strolling the promenade. I'd be passing by with a big trash cart. I used to feel a little, what they would say in the vernacular, stink because you know mm -hmm. I didn't want anyone mm -hmm. from class to say, hey, "This is Christian over there, the mm -hmm. garbage guy over there." But you know, it gave me character. You know, I was making all of four dollars an hour. So that engagement with with enterprise and industry and hard work, you know, when I I I, I would have collapsed had I not had some seasoning prior as a cadet, which yep. is to stick with it, as you say, faith, 
Um, if there's one word that can characterize any success I've had is faith, prayerfulness. I didn't like to pray. My parents had me pray, but when I got to the Washington and the cold started to kick my, you know what, you know, I knelt on my knee, I went to my knees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I learned, I'd already known the Lord's Prayer, but I learned for real, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. Yes, 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 yes. You make it to me to lie down in green pastures. You know? That's right, that's right. But when you look that, back that now, when you look back now, from where you are now, and you look back, it will serve the purpose to build you who, as to who you are now, I'm sure, because you need, yes, yes. need that season and you need that foundation. And if yes, things were yes. to you, you wouldn't be the distinguished author, distinguished lawyer, distinguished husband, family man that you are. So everything is a building block that puts you to further. Because, because and, and Darren, I think this kind of engagement we have this morning is important, you know, because I, I do, um, we, we did a cadet civics leadership handbook and I, I'm, read where there are some segments of our Caribbean community in the UK and the United States even and other places. Um, sometimes you see the WhatsApp messages. I get involved in criminal activity. And my fear is that we must not tarry in telling the story of our greats. Because it's, I mean, I was a big, you know, I used to read um, Victor, Valiant, Bino, and so on. I used to read Look and Learn. And I used to read, if, I mean, Reader's Digest and the biographies of great people like Churchill, for instance, right? People who had a certain indefatigable faith and courage to overcome the vicissitudes of life. And mm -hmm. so my thinking is, if we can speak more to those value systems and give less credence to nasty music, I think we can have a better go. What are your thoughts? Well, exactly. I think um, there is there is... Uh, some entrepreneurial thinking in Dominica I've seen they're doing the programs especially online programs so I think it's starting to you know especially as Dominica wants to go digital the younger folk are trying to get into that now but in my view probably with hindsight that should have started long before now but we know Dominica's small the resources aren't there um I don't know if there's an, an entrepreneurial kind of thing at the state college where people can learn about how to start a business or what type of business they want to run because a lot of people start businesses, I'm sure, in America, even here in England, and they don't last two minutes, or they last maybe two years. They're not good with finances, or they can't find the clients or the customers, or they, they need a loan, they can't, the, can't pay back the loan. So running a business is not easy. You know that, I know that. But someone just says they want to run a business, you probably need some coaching or speak to a mentor. And I think that's what they need to have in Dominica is mentors that have been there, done that, whether it's from selling food at the roadside to maybe opening up a shop in due course. Mentor or then see if it's right for you rather than everyone just say, I want to, because everyone wants to get rich quick. Let's face it in Dominic, everyone wants to get rich quick. There's no really get rich quick or overnight yeah. success. In my view, you have to put in the work, put in the effort. Um, and, and I think that's what we need to be teaching at the state college or have a thing on entrepreneurial um, engagement. You know what it is to be, an, everyone wants to use the word entrepreneur, but nobody really know, knows what it means and or wants to, wants to, Darren, would you be willing to be part of a group to work with the State College to do what you call long distance learning that speaks to rule of law, entrepreneurship, uh, you know, the sort of the, the contours of that value system that can help young people along the way? Sort of like a mentorship circle. I'd be happy to. I mean, as long as it fits in with my time schedule, I'd be happy to because I'm all for yeah. giving back. I feel I've. Mm -hmm been blessed and I feel I should give back so if it means that I will happily do that but I think that is what's needed whether it's through me doing it through you or someone else doing it I just think it's needed because Indeed. say there's there doesn't appear to be that kind of um let's call it representation of you have your nassives which are good businessmen Sam Raphael is a good businessman but they're in the hotel industry not everyone may want to go into the hotel industry or the, the you might want to start um you know some eco eco or natural or soups or whatever or, or, you just need to know how to tap into that type of thing. Um, and it needs someone that's, that's not necessarily done that in industry, but can start you up on business and what to look out for, the pitfalls, and say finances is one. We have a lot of black businesses in England. They start up a barber shop or a woman's hair shop. They get the clients, one year, 18 months, bailiffs are coming because they haven't paid bills or the, the, the accountant hasn't... It, it's the, I think the finances is one of the strongest things in business, the finance. So we, we have financial literacy... The importance yeah. of savings. Savings. So that needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is what needs in Dominica because um, I, I don't know. Yeah. I think it's needed and I don't know how we're going to get there. And it needs to move from this handout, handout business. Um, 
as well. Yeah. Otherwise, you get too, too, too dependent on handouts. And then that puts, I suppose, why would you work if you're getting handouts? But I always would work personally. I always would. I wouldn't, I'd, I'd stop. When, when, was, when, was, when did you have your first job, Darren? Well, I, I had a paper round, which is where you deliver papers of the morning. Um, yeah. and that Daily was, Telegraph? Uh, it wasn't the Daily Telegraph. At that time, it was the Times, uh, the Times newspaper. And uh, so that would have been around 13, 14. I used to deliver the papers of the morning, sometimes cold mornings. a bicycle? Yeah, I had a bicycle. That's right. Sometimes cold mornings like you had in the harbor there. You have to get up and go to the store to pick up the papers. You get your route and the numbers. So I did that, and I also did it on weekends as well. So it was uh, not virtually seven days because I used to alternate. But certainly four days out of the week, I would do the morning papers and sometimes also the evening paper, uh, delivered the evening paper. Darren, let me ask you, I didn't ask you this earlier, but maybe I should have. Do you have a lamp that you could put maybe uh, in front of you? Because the lower part of your face is like, okay, this is much better. Oh, yes, yes. This sir. is much better, yes. Because I want to see your whole face. When you're in the corner, yeah, this is better. So coming back to, um, let's talk about uh, your first job. Your first job was a paper route, and then what was the next job? So the next job was when I was at uh, college. I worked in an engineering firm um, doing uh, what we call prop shafts and drive shafts, repairing them which wasn't my, uh, you know, you had to wear overalls and get your hands dirty. So it wasn't my type of thing, but I still enjoyed it. I enjoyed the the work. I enjoyed the clients or the customers that would come in. I enjoyed learning. So and you're was... working in a mechanic shop? Yeah, I was working in a kind of a mechanic shop. That's right, with overalls and, and get your hands really dirty. But I say, I knew I didn't want to be in that long term, but it paid reasonably well. I could have my independence. The hours were good. And it was, a, I felt I was learning a new skill. So I kept with it. And what was the next job after that one? So that was in a firm of solicitors as a clerk. <clears throat> um, again, during uh, university holidays, this was um, in, in the temple in London. We mentioned earlier inner temple and middle temple. They're the inns of court. But this was between, but the office was between both of them. So it was uh, very good. I did that in university holidays. So th that also helped. Um, Travelled into London um, and got exposure to cases, ongoing cases and bits of drafting. And then that's what really uh, got me into the uh, pursuing the legal career. Mm -hmm. So let me ask this question. And then, of course, you went into practice once you got your license that's right. to yeah. the bar exam. Yeah. And and how how many days of the bar exam? It was two days. It's two days over here. Oh gosh, uh, there were different elements to it. So you had an exam for your drafting. You had an exam for advocacy. You had an exam for uh, conference skills negotiation. Uh, I I think each one had an exam. I don't know if it was over two days. It may have been longer. Um, but it was quite intense. It was quite intense. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about your mother. She's still with us. Yes, mom is still here. Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, how How old is she now? She is eighty two. Outstanding, outstanding. And um, do you? So that's your British side of the family. Yes, yes. Was yeah. did your parents have any problems? Because I mean, he was Dominican and she was British. Uh, if they had, they've never been told to me. Um, yes. So maybe I'm sure they would have. Uh, but I've never been told to me. Yes, indeed. And and in England, uh, you know, here in the United States, in the South, certainly, which was a part of the country involving the Confederacy and the Civil War, where they wanted to maintain slavery, you had segregation legally. You know, it's a blacks or colored and then white and so on. You never had that in England. But I've been told that, of course, you had the National Front, you know, Powell saying, OK, go back. And you had people being called, you know, wogs and so on. But you always got the sense that in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, uh, the whole racial issue was always more muted because it didn't take it uh, take into it was it was never manifested in law. Mm. It was always manifested in personal prejudice. What is your opinion on that, and what has your experience been? So, uh, racism when my father came was quite overt. So you'd be told no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. You would be called the N word to your face you would be told not to come into a certain bar for a drink because they didn't want black people. So quite overt. Over the years, it's become covert to the extent that a black person will now apply for a job. They might go through the process of having the interview, but all the while the employer knows they're not going to get the job, they're just going through the process. So it's become covert um, and different strategies are put in place to you know, put what I call banana skins in the way of... of BME. BME stands for Black Minority Ethnic People trying to progress. Um, but it's how you navigate them, which is important because um, the employment 
field is a minefield. Um, even though you may have two people, one with the or both with the right qualifications, I think just people's biases will always favour what they know or what they feel they look like them, or you know they won't try and go different. Uh, but you have to. I've navigated it in law, and uh, other people have navigated it in law. It's just maybe it's a bit of luck. Um, but is it stick a pin in that? Is it a bit of luck, or is it be is it about basically? Being intelligent in 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 crafting certain socialization skills because at the, at the end of the day we're all human beings. Yes, and yes. so you're very right. People generally tend to deal with people who look like them That's or right. favor people who look like them. That's the inherent bias of all human beings, right? Um, uh, but but when you when you when you is it the case based on your experience that if you are uh, able to um, in your characteristics in your disposition. Be open, open, intelligent, competent, diligent, industrious, affable, that you might just be able to even wean over those who may have had an inherent prejudice. Talk to that. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's exactly right, because um, I can only use my own example. I, I, I can what I call, I have what I call cultural competence, if I put it like that. I can be a Dominican and get into Calypso and talk all about Dominica, and I can switch and talk to a law lord about the Supreme Court case or whatever. So I have the cultural competence. Um, and I'm not saying other Dominic or whatever don't, I'm just saying I can switch quite easily and talk on various things, classical music, read the Telegraph or the Times. I can I can talk current affairs and I don't try and limit myself. That's not to boast or brag. I'm just saying to have a wide repertoire of what you can do, I think will, as you say, win someone over, that you're not just this kind of what we call one trick pony. You only know about Dominic or you only know about about rap music or you only know about this the, the, the. so try not to be limiting if you can have a, a wide view or a wide repertoire that i think will help you know and i yeah that's, that's an amazing story uh never be a one-trick pony never have be a, a wide repertoire which i guess you know comes to, to the issue of studied effort or being studious right uh, correct correct yeah because the only way you can create that work but wise by exposing yourself to learning and having a broad uh, ban a bandwidth of of of, of that which is uh, learned, you know, that shows you a learned person. Because I always tell my children and other people that human beings, despite their inherent prejudices, uh, respect competence, diligence, and productivity in all species of things. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I will tell you this particular story. So I'm a clerk. It's 1988-89. I'm just coming into one year. And we're in the kitchen at the law firm and the senior partner, Thomas A. Alvin Farrington is saying, he's going to have a dinner meeting of the World War II Club. So he was not speaking to me, he was speaking to someone else, one of the partners. And I overheard him and I said, oh, the World War II Club, what's the subject on, uh, how, how's that work? And he says, oh, we're talking about the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. And then I, I talked about the Wormack's last offensive on the Western Front after Normandy, which was his last strategic effort to throw back the allies into the Atlantic after Normandy, and they burst through the Ardennes, and they had the Battle of Bastogne, and so he was standing there, and he was awed. He says, Gabe, hey, what do you know about all that stuff? Well, I mean, I never wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah. What I ever wanted to be was a soldier. People yeah. said I could speak well, and that's how I ended up as a lawyer. That's right. lawyer was law, law was never my interest. It was all military right. science. So yeah. Farrington, Darren Sylvester, invites me to the World War II Club, and during COVID, I've gotten two letters, which I'll scan and send to you, mm -hmm. Who are the members of the World War II Club? Well, Court of Special Appeals, Judge Salmon, Judge Kasula, Judge Jerry Devlin, uh, Judge Nichols, uh, Ralph Powers, whose father, Judge Powers, tried Andrew Bremer, who shot uh, the, uh, George Wallace, the segregationist uh, presidential candidate in Maryland, sometime in 69, 70. Those were all people old enough to be my parent. I was only black and only law clerk, only non-lawyer. And I continued on through my remaining clerkship and became a lawyer and, until his death. And I believe when I look back on it, that that is why I ultimately became his partner because we had an engagement beyond the law. Now, had I not been learned had I, been, had I been, as you said, a one-trick pony, 
so he he felt pride in bringing me and because I could hold court with people who were twice my age. And so it's so important for young people to expose themselves through uh, the library system and through uh, different kinds of music, not just one kind, uh, you know, so that way you can have different bases upon which to engage with the multiplicity of ethnicities in all parts of the world. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So Has I think that been your experience? Yes, it has. Certainly, um, in, in, in my legal experience, I can say I can strike up or had have have had conversations on a multiplicity of different subjects outside of law, say classical music and um, you know shooting and hunting. No, I don't shoot or hunt, but you do always converse in those areas equally important. Um, and being, being well read, uh, using the library system, I couldn't agree more. I'm an avid fan of a library. I do like peace and quiet, but also to get engrossed in a good book or a paper or research anything, it's important. And I think those skills are becoming less and less because everyone wants on their phone, if they can't Google it, the answer they give up. But we will learn to research things long before Google through different resources. Uh, if non-law stuff was Encyclopedia Britannica or, or um, Childcraft was the books in America, I think you will have Childcraft in Britannica. And it, that, that takes time. You know, it wasn't instant. You didn't get answers instantly. You had to research stuff. But now everyone wants things instantly at Google. And okay, if they can get it, fine. You save time. But it's the skills that you're being that are being lost. So, for example, you may have heard with Chat GTP, there was an yeah. American case where, when the judge researched the cases, they didn't actually exist. They were they were. It made it made it up. It made it up. It made it up. It made it up. And so that would, ne that would never point. happen if someone had done their research properly, because everyone Absolutely. wants shortcuts, take shortcuts, and get things quick. But if someone done the research. Properly, this Chat GPT is dangerous. Yeah. Let me tell you how dangerous it is. So I asked it to say, uh, who was Henkel Lockenberg Christian? Mm. That's my father's older brother. Mm. I know who he was, but I wanted to see what it was going to say. Mm. It gave me a lot of garbage. What it yeah. did was it synthesized stuff from some guy in St. Lucia and some of the stuff that had nothing to do with him. Now, had I not been someone who was intimately aware of who he was, mm. or knowledgeable as to who he was, and I could have been had. Mm -hmm. So one has to be extremely careful, and that's why one must always have one, an, almost an independent base of intelligence. Mm -hmm. So one can, even where using the technology, be able to scrutinize the technology, or else you know it can lead us astray. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it can lead us astray because it's right now it's an aggregator, mm -hmm. and it can aggregate based on its coding incorrectly. Mm -hmm. That's so right. That was certainly the case with that of my uncle's um, report it gave me. So one has to be very careful. How important is that cultural competence and that studied effort to nation building? Uh, extremely. It's a short answer, extremely. Because uh, Dominicans in Dominica, that maybe have not left uh, Dominica, still need to be aware of what's going on in Canada, America, England, and have to be able to, so when people from the diaspora visit, they can have something to engage with rather than just knowing where they're from in Marigot or Wesley or Point Michel or, or wherever. Um, I find when I've been to Dominica, the paper, the Chronicle and the Sun, for example, only come out once a week. Whereas in America and England, we have daily papers and 24 hour news. Now, okay, if you haven't got anything to write every day, you don't need a paper every day. But the same way that DNO has pretty much news every day on refreshing articles. I believe there should be a daily paper in the island so that people can have access to not just news, but comment, analysis, opinion, It's and to critically analyze, critically assess. Everyone can talk and say, this, this is that and that is this, but reason, judgment, you know, as I say, critically analyze, critically assess. You get that from good newspapers, which I'm not saying the Chronicle and the Sun are no, no good, but they don't really have the analysis and the opinion, and they come out only once a week. And that's something I think needs changing for people to really have a broader um, knowledge of what's going on worldwide. You know? Indeed. Um, how important do you think in a nation state, especially a small island, developing nation state, is the, uh, the importance of having a national library system? 
again, extremely, I keep using the word extremely, but the uh, Dawn was just in Dominica. You spoke to her, I think, uh, two days or so ago. And she informed me the, the Rosa Library is under um, some form of construction. Now, okay, fine. But we have, have a temporary library, uh, wherever it may be, in town, or, or have a temporary, don't just shut the whole thing down. Um, and she was given a book by my aunt to put in the library and couldn't do, couldn't do that. Um, so where students are studying, I don't know. Uh, but, okay, everything needs to be refurbished and, and updated from time to time. But I still think there should be a mobile library or a temporary library. Or, but it, it just seems that people are just happy to close things down and not, not reopen them. And I, I, I disagree. A library is a key uh, component of any community. Yes. As, as someone, thank you very much, as someone of African descent, you know, the Queen has just passed away. And there are people who say, well, she should have had uh, the opportunity to have dealt with um, issues of rep reparations. Before we talk about reparations, how do you look back, and, and my condolences again on her passing, um, you know, whatever the, uh, the, the ills of uh, colonialism were, I can tell you that I have very fond memories of that period uh, when I grew up in Dominica. Um, I felt that Dominica was a more law-abiding and honest and well-run country. Um, and uh, that's the time that black people came into power. Mm. It was during the time of her reign. So I don't have any uh, negatives to be, to be frank with you about that period. And we were all born at the Princess Margaret Hospital, which was a real, uh, really well-run hospital uh, run by Dominicans. Mm. And uh, so Dominicans who were caring and, 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 and uh, competent uh, with the tools that they had at their disposal. We were able to get to a place where we had, uh, at one point in the 1980s, the highest life expectancy in the Americas. And because of socialized medicine, we had uh, the highest uh, per capita population of centenarians. And so all of that, uh, you know, uh, I, I look at the context. You know, the fact is we were, you know, visited, I remember, by Royal War, uh, Royal Navy warships. The first time I had peaches and cream was on a Royal Navy warship. And and uh, we had no gangs of drug dealing people, gangsters shooting around, shooting people. It, it was a very quiet and uh, bucolic of course, we had a lot of needs that we wanted to um, uh, uh, take care of. Uh, it was not uh, paradise or heaven on earth. In fact, that's why I got involved in the independence movement. But I'm just looking back now and comparing to what happens in other places in the world. We had no civil war. We had very quiet lives. We leave our doors open and go to the market, come back, and nothing untouched, everything untouched. And so my question to you is, what is your opinion on the Queen's legacy? And then we'll talk about reparations and how you think if it should be given, how it should be done? Well, the Queen has left a, a remarkable legacy of 70 years worth of dedicated service, um, which is never going to really be matched again. Head of the Commonwealth. <clears throat> okay, the Commonwealth reduced during her time and a lot of countries went independent, Barbados being, I think, the last. Um, it's now a republic. But uh, I think it's, it's unanimously agreed. She gave dedicated service. Um, gave her life to the job and was well respected throughout the world um, as as for all that she did and achieved. Um, I certainly watched her funeral and mourned her passing and uh, and uh, saw King Charles uh, the uh, his coronation. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think uh, the monarchy has been around a thousand years, uh, Brother Gabe, uh, from the Battle of Hastings and, and uh, so on. It's a thousand year old institution. Uh, people, I'm, I respect people's views that wish to, um, you know, say it should be abolished and this type of thing. But I think it's if it survived that long, it's going to survive uh, or outlive you and me. So, um, yeah. yeah, I I have a very nuanced view. I'm a Republican, small R. Uh -huh. I believe in a republic, but I also believe in heritage and the importance of heritage. Yeah. And even if uh, England would move to would to move to Republican status, I'd like to see the heritage preserved. Mm. Um, so that because it has its own value, right? It has its own value. That 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 character and contour and filigree um, gives a particular characteristic to the British nation that I think is quite um, uh, inspiring. Mm. And uh, uh, I, I will tell you, uh, as an old bandsman, you know, in the cadets, you know, our officers. I just spoke to Major Francis Richards, and when he was appointed a lieutenant. His commission was signed by the Queen. And uh, he stayed here with me. We revived the Cadet Corps because we saw after independence, it was put out of service. And we saw the 
negative result of that uh, in the way of young people not having leadership and guidance. And so when when uh, the queen died, the funeral was taking place. I was in the air. I was on my way to the Africa Aerospace Defense Expo at Whitcliffe Air Force Base in South Africa, outside Pretoria. And so I bought uh, I bought uh, I bought Wi-Fi for one and one only reason. One one reason only, so I could listen to the bands <laughs> play what is the most magnificent repertoire. Because as a bandsman, I tell you, it's very hard to blow and march. People don't realize how hard it is. You've got to blow. And keep time in the march is a very difficult thing. But to hear the selection of what they were able to do, uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, I still play it in my car sometimes on the way to court if I'm of a half hour, 45 minutes an hour, just mm -hmm. to listen to, to the... So 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 that kind of cultural um, leavening, if I can call it that, is worthwhile of any nation. Mm -hmm. You know, simply as a cultural artifact uh, that uh, speaks to organized effort in music, in 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 uh, let's say uh, how you memorialize someone, the process of memorialization, the the spectacle. It's the human enterprise that has value because it all comes from a degree of creativity. It's not crass. It's not uncouth it's not brutish it actually has a sudden gloss that is rendered in the process that makes life colorful and worthwhile and that is where i think you know if you take away racial hierarchy and class prejudice and snobbery all of which have been part and parcel of royalty in the past and you look at a modern manifestation because the thing about it is as we go through life is to be able to excise from society that which is cancerous, toxic, unworthy, as in prejudice, slavery, colonialism, and retain those values and those facets that are appealing and actually add value to the human uh, uh, being and our existence on earth. And that's my view on, on the royalty and the whole issue of Republic versus, but the issue of reparations. Obviously, Africa and the Caribbean uh, were exploited and added to the value of Britain's uh, exchequer and the Industrial Revolution. The Guardian came out with an impressive story of the, uh, the role that uh, uh, Iron Smiths in Jamaica played in the court process that improved British uh, steelmaking, and um, that uh, uh, for three thousand years BCE there was an iron civilization in Africa, something we didn't already know. We all thought those things were. Uh, all, all out of the uh, engagement with Europe. How important is reparations? And if it were to be done, how should it be approached, in your view? Yeah, I mean, the, the reparations has been ongoing for, I can remember, quite a few years. I went to a lecture with Sir Hilary Beckles, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, who was the Vice Chancellor of uh, UE, probably more than 10 years ago now, uh, in London. And reparations was being spoken about then. And probably there's been some movement, but I think in an ideal world, it should happen because we all know things like sugar, um, cotton, all that was taken from the Caribbean to enrich England, uh, as well as artifacts uh, and gold and things like that. From a practical point of view... And, and people. And people, well, of course, and people. Um, <laughs> from a practical point of view, I don't know how you get to a value of what can compensate for what went on, the atrocities of slavery. Um, which we mustn't forget, even that as bad as it was, was legal, apparently, at the yeah. time, was legal. However much we may say as lawyers, we disliked it, and it was abhorrent and atrocious. Law until the summer, on, well, interestingly, not in the United Kingdom, on, until, of course, and that's why the Somerset case uh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. basically, um, you know, said that, you know, there's no slavery in England, and any, any anything like slavery so odious must be the product of positive law, which means statute. And since there's no statute as to slavery, the England, the 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 um, uh, the, uh, the uh, African American Somerset had to be released, mm. and, and he was released. And of course, there are many people who say that the American Revolution was a reaction to that. That they felt, well, if the British government, if the British judiciary is taking that position, and we are colonies of the mother in well, mother nation, mother country, then what will happen soon? Because we're common law is the precedent set in the mother country may soon enough percolate into the colonies and then right. uh, we'll be dispossessed. 
and, and it was a, it was an analysis that I only came into into learning about within the past two or three years. Yeah, yeah. How how the Somerset case may have triggered the American Revolution, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but but uh, so as a practical matter, it may not be possible because you're right. Yeah. How do you value that? But I, what I could be done? That. And also causation, you know. If my grandfather, if my great 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 grandfather or your great 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 grandfather was a slave, and there's talking, there's talk about you know the mental atrocities that have come down through generations. How do you not only value that? But how do you look at that from a causation point of view? Uh, you know, we're talking five, six, seven generations, and um, because I, I'm hearing things like the reason some black people may be dyslexic or may have mental condition is all through slavery now how do you i'm not saying it's right or wrong but how do you prove that how do you i just don't i'm maybe i'm not bright enough to to work how you it's it's almost not value let me, let, yeah, let me you raise a very interesting point my, my view on that is in the same period of time black people within one generation given the opportunities mm. of good governance have shown the ability to excel at the highest level Mm. That's the reality as well. Mm. And mm. to uh, become, you know, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and scientists of all kinds mm. and composers of the highest caliber, musicians mm. of the highest caliber. Mm. So it's not all, you know, black and white, it's shades of gray. Yep. That's right. And my view on, 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 on reparations is that if there are 24 hours in a day, mm. assuming that about a third of that should be spent sleeping if we want to be healthy. Then the other two thirds, how do we apportion that in way of work? Of that, I think only about one hour should be given to the idea because I think it's really a misplaced focus. Mm. I believe the focus should be on engagement. Right now, that's more equitable. Mm. I think places like the UK and the United States would be well, well served to invest less in militarism, missiles and tanks and fighters, and more into marine science, uh, environmental sciences, fair trade, university partnerships, things that can allow for the easy transmission of skill sets and competence, and most importantly, rule of law and good governance. Yeah. Because in countries like Nigeria and others that are very wealthy, I wouldn't even talk about some in the Middle East that are very wealthy, what they're doing with the wealth is a crying shame. And it's not then the questions of the vicissitudes of slavery and colonialism but what people are doing right now. Yes, sure. Right now. So oftentimes, I think, for political convenience, people are uh, uh, given to looking back because it's easy to do that. Easy. Yes. So they don't have to confront What's going the on? cancer staring them in the face. Mm -hmm. And that's that's my that's my comment on reparations. It's uh, know, it's, it's nice and high minded to talk about it, mm -hmm. but it's uh, I wouldn't want I don't want to go to the extreme of calling it a fool's errand. But I think it's misplaced energy when there are things right now that we can do as uh, people in the Caribbean and in the diaspora to better our condition. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, slavery, uh, I think history teaches, maybe we, we had the worst of it with the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. But when you consider the fact that we have been able to overcome so much of that, you understand that there are other places where slavery existed and people were never able to overcome. And there are people in places now where they never had slavery who live worse lives than we do. So how do you how do you deal with that? Well, you know, look, the world the world has changed since even you've been around. I've been around. The world has changed, and we've got things in England going on now: sex trafficking, uh, trafficking of um, people trying to get over on the boats, asylum seekers, and things like this. As you say, these are the current issues that. Prime Minister uh, Rishi Sunak is trying to deal with. Um, all, all I will say is that these issues are quite complex because when you go back to the boats, why would someone, unless they are in genuine risk of persecution, risk their life crossing the channel with their family, wife, children, or family, knowing that that could all sink unless their life in their home country has to be so bad and this is what some people are not recognizing um uh, and going back to you these are the current points we have to contend with you know immigration uh asylum and it's not just england it's germany it's france i'm sure in america too um 
and and for me reparations is 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 an important issue but like you rightly say i don't think it needs to be given much um much mileage much time because of what's going on now we have a, in england i'm sure in america we have a, a cost of living crisis we are still recovering from the effects of covid uh, we we had an economic crisis not too long ago. Um, interest rates, inflation, these affect people on a day to day level, rather than reparations for slavery, which is, you can't really, in my view, quantify. You can't have a causation argument on. Um, you can't say the effects. Everyone. <laughs> and where are you going to get the where, where are you going to get the money for it? If you if, if you have to say pay the money, where sure, are you going to get the money sure, for? It? Sure. Sure. So that, that in a roundup is where my thinking is, is as you agreeing with you, concurring with you, it's the day-to-day -day thing that affects people's lives I think we have to be, be conscious of and mindful of. And certainly in, in London, in England, there's uh, a multitude of things that I've just listed that are affecting people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I'm sure it's not too far, if not the same in America. Uh, uh, Brother Darren, this has been a wonderful engagement. There's so much more we could speak about, but I want to ask a few more questions having to do with uh, your links to Dominica and what are the things that uh, having visited Dominica for several, on, uh, I'll take it several occasions. Yeah, 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 several, yeah, yeah, several occasions. Yeah, yeah. What are the kind of advantages you think we have as a country that are not being harvested in a purposeful way, vis-a-vis -vis selling our passports or maybe in giving the country over to China? Well, I mean, I think it was the Prime Minister of Vincent and Grenadines recently said he's not into this selling of passports, um, and obviously each country has its its own. Kind of sovereignty his own constitution um this was done from eugenia charles this time it's not a new thing that mr skerritt has been doing or even edison james before him it's just the way it's been run i don't think it's been run right um or run there needs to be much more due diligence there needs to be much more um scrutiny of the process um because when it was in eugenia charles's time and uh, edison james's time i don't remember any of these these issues arising about passports getting into the hands of corrupt nash corrupt people and diplomatic passports being issued and, and the country not knowing about it and so on. So I think it's the process that needs to be revamped or revisited. Um, but the country itself, we shouldn't be importing water from Antigua when we have 365 rivers, natural springs. And again, it's just ideas. It's just ideas. People with ideas need to come and utilize the natural resources that Dominica has, water, um, you, you know, the the sun using using the solar panels uh, and and generating energy like that. We were talking about geothermal. It probably will work, um, but it's it's a big it's a big endeavor. Um, but I think a country like Dominica has to try certain things because we can't rely on handouts from other countries all the time. If there's another hurricane or a tsunami or a, an earthquake, we can't keep going to the IMF and the EU asking. We have to have something we can do for ourselves. So when after Maria and Erica, you know, all the power lines were down, you couldn't contact families, they're now talking about trying to put them underground. Yes, it's a good thing. So that if anything happens like that again, we are we are not too badly affected. But um the other point you made was about was about um passports. And what was the other point? Forgive me. Uh, I've got well, I mean, what are the natural resources we have you think we should focus on instead yeah. of selling passports? Right. So you mentioned the water. Yeah. What about a human resource? What human about networking or human resource? Yeah. Um, I think there are a lot of people in Dominica with good good ideas, good yeah. vision, good visionaries. I think there needs to be some sort of symporia, symporia, symporium where these people can get together half a day, um, a day, it can be on Zoom or whatever, and just really have a, a think tank of how Dominica going into the you know these last few years of the of the 2020s with the impact of AI coming on, on the back of that, well, how can Dominica really put itself in an advanced position going forward? And what ideas can be generated? I think it needs a symposium. I don't think one person has the answer. Um, I have well, ideas, you have ideas, but I think a symposium would be the right way forward. You know that uh, Vincent John uh, was part of the second symposium in 2002 yeah. or three in, in UK. The first one was in uh, New York City in Brooklyn. In I attended the second one in the UK, yes. yeah. That's right. So that's what the Dominica Academy of Arts and Sciences yes. sought to do, build a think tank, mm -hmm. network all people under one umbrella to ch exchange ideas. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy that that's recognized by you, and I'm happy that you attended, mm -hmm. and because I think that's when we first started to know each other. Yes, that's right. That's right. That would have been around 2003, I seem to recall. Three yes. Or, 
yeah, yeah. Yes. It was at the Absolutely. High Commission in London. I, I was there. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. By the way, uh, were you the one who uh, was at the cenotaph this year to give the uh, wreath? Because I know of no better ambassador in England uh, than for Don Mika than uh, uh, Sylvester. That, 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 that's in the ha capable hands of our High Commissioner. Uh, yeah, who's that anyway? I don't know. Who is that today? Uh, it's uh, Miss Miss Janet Charles. Is the High I see. Yeah, yes, I see. Yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, Darren, I, I want to say uh, uh, I'm going to ask you a sort of omnibus question. Uh -huh. uh, anything you'd like to say to our Dominican people as we enter the new year of 2024 very soon and we look back at 2023 and the sanctions in position and maybe what you can do to intercede with Lord Cameron to say, let's set up a system where we uh, give a visa-free access to Dominicans who can trace their antecedents prior to 1978. Wouldn't that be a way to do it? Well, possibly, possibly. But I think, yeah, it's it's been, a, uh, this year, 2023, we didn't have any hurricanes or natural disasters. That's got to be a good thing. We have to give thanks for that. We've got to thank, thank God for that. We've got to thank God for that because uh, we've been spared. We thought in the hurricane season we might get tropical storms and they passed us. And we've got to be thankful for that. I don't think Dominica could cope, not only financially, but uh, it also does have having to deal with the after effects of another natural disaster. There's talk of an airport being built. Marigot Hospital is still not fully open to my understanding. Resources have to be then either diverted to deal with that. I don't think Dominica could cope. Um, but what I say to Dominicans is that we have to, uh, you know, keep the faith. We have to have hope. We have to try and be visionaries. We, despite the odds, we have to try and forge ahead. Uh, in the Bible, it tells us, you know, we've got to fight the good fight, and and uh, we can't give up. And however that may be to each individual, you have to fight your own fight and run your own race. And but what I would encourage, as I said earlier, is those who are business minded and have ideas, um, seek mentorship, seek investment, um, seek wise counsel. And um, let 2024 be the year that, uh, you know, dreams and ambitions come true. Thank you very much. I couldn't put it better. Thank you, Darren, for being a good example to uh, Dominicans overseas and being an uh, example uh, in way of uh, civic leadership and the ideas you've shared and the um, intelligence you've shared. And I certainly look forward to you maybe working with us to engage the uh, Foreign Secretary or uh, Home Secretary on the uh, visa restrictions. To, I think there's a way to craft a way for Dominicans to still uh, do well with that. And certainly on the issue of library systems development and just general development. I want to thank you for being a leader mm -hmm. and for uh, offering us some of your busy schedule after your uh, uh, your engagement at the market and palace today, of course, I see that tongue in cheek, but I know you're normally in high society and uh, we, we, we're proud of you nonetheless. And uh, I didn't ask you uh, the question, but uh, do you have any issue of your body? Any issue of? Your body. I'm using the old English terminology for uh, offspring. Oh, well, uh, I always say what will be, will be. So uh, you know. <laughs> You're still a young man. It's the one, uh, yeah, it's the, what will be, will be. And if it's the work, it's the work, you know, it will work. <laughs> yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Well, God bless you, Darren. God bless Dawn, your, your you, wife, man. and, uh, you know, you. your family and your mom and, and the memory of your father. Thank and, you. And uh, I, I want to let you know, I, I really appreciate our, our brotherhood and I look forward to us doing a great many good things before the good Lord checks us out. Well, that's right. And thank you for your time, your Saturday, giving up your Saturday afternoon in, uh, in Washington uh, or Maryland uh, for taking the time to ask these uh, very, very good questions. And I'm grateful for the interaction. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, God bless you. Have a blessed weekend. You too. Thank you.